to get to the bottom of, of who did this. Here in Ballypatrick Forest, several miles from Ballycastle, that a farmer out checking his sheep made the grizzly discovery. The father of 18-year-old Inga Maria Hauser flew back to Germany yesterday after identifying his daughter's body. I believe the motive uh, to be sexual, and uh, she died as a result of putting up a fight. And who took, who took my baby sister away, and why? What did she do wrong? She was a good person. She did not deserve this, to die this way. First of all, um, Helena Dalit O'Driscoll is going to speak. Helena is the, the daughter of um, John Dalit, who took a very personal interest in this case very early on when there was very little publicity around Inga's case. John was the person who kept it in the spotlight throughout that time. And Helena, would you like to talk just about how your father came across this case and how personally he felt about it? Yeah, and absolutely it was very personal. He's campaigned in this. 
practice for over 30 years um, and his dedication to it was phenomenal. Firstly, because he was so proud of this place that we call home. He was mortified that this incident could happen here. Our home was known worldwide for its hospitality, so he was mortified that that could happen. I think as well, the fact that the perpetrator's never been brought to justice, that really saddened him for the Hauser family. Very simply, and it's really evident in all his correspondence with the police through the years, is that it's a simple reason he was a father with a daughter who travelled Europe. The difference was I came back safe and unharmed every time. It was incredibly personal to him. He, in fact, it was one of the last things that he worked on. As many know, we lost, we lost them very recently. But even at, to cancer, and even at the very end, when he was incredibly frail, he he was still working on the case. He couldn't even make his way to his computer, but he wrote, the last thing he wrote was a handwritten press release that he wanted out in the anniversary of Linda Maria's disappearance. And he knew, because I'd been working alongside him for so long, I could have written it easily. But it was so personal to him that he insisted it had to be done. And I feel... Given all his hard work, I feel like I have a personal responsibility to, to continue that work for him and contribute in whatever way I can. When your father was here in the early days, when there was very little interest in this case, but we're sort of at, at a point now where there could be a PPS decision in, in the coming weeks. It's sad that he didn't live to, to see that through, but you feel very personally, don't you, that he would have wanted you to continue on in, in his name? He absolutely would have, and I remember the excitement even when the decision was made to submit the files to the, P the PPS that he he saw it as an, an important chink of light, and he certainly wouldn't be given up now. If he she was a musician, she was an artist, she was a composer, but above all, she was the daughter of the Hauser family. Let us appeal in support of the PSNI for those witnesses who know about Inga Maria's murder to gather the confidence to come forward. And I think they must take confidence uh, from the fact that so many of you have gathered here today in support of that campaign. Claire McKeegan from Phoenix Law. Claire, you came to this case if you want to just explain how, but I know that, that John Dallin himself had spoke to me about how, how grateful he was when you came on board because it gave new life to the case and the investigation. How did you first come across the case of um, Inga Maria? Well, the Hauser family first instructed me in 2018 after 30 years of struggling for justice without any legal representation and never having been told by the PSNI or anyone in a position of power that they were entitled to a lawyer or entitled to legal aid. The Hauser family are of very limited means and did not realize that they were even entitled to have someone um, acting for them and providing representation and, and advocating for Inga. And I find that really disturbing. I find it really uh, shocking. Um, uh, for many reasons, this case is shocking and disturbing, but uh, one of the reasons is the lack of contact between the, the police, um, any civil authorities and, and this family. I find that when I look through the, the bundle of correspondence that I've seen that went to the Hauser family from uh, the, the RUC at the time, and I find 13 letters, um, some of them uh, in, in English, uh, the majority of them in English, over the course of a 30-year period uh, to receive 13 letters, most of them in English, um, to this German-speaking family based in Munich. Um, very scant in detail um, and the lack of care that, that I could see there, I actually found it really quite upsetting when you looked at this, this being a family who had suffered a, 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 such tragic loss to lose their, their youngest daughter here uh, in our soil um, and, and to have that, that complete lack of care um, and a lack of attention and, and only for the likes of, of John Dallet, um, they would have had no one here, no one advocating for that, uh, for that loss, no one fighting for Inga 
Um, and for many, many years, uh, this case was cold. Um, when I look at the paperwork, the, there's a period of nine years that had passed uh, between one letter from the RUC and the next one that went to, to the Hauser family. Um, and, and that whole period, the, there was a, a period where the case had closed completely. And um, it was just a cold case at that stage. And um, John Dallet um, had been writing to the, the, the police and asking for updates and doing everything he could to bring media scrutiny and attention onto this case because he felt so strongly about it. And I know just from my first meeting with, with John and with Keely, who joined us today, um, and, and I met Helena at that stage too, and I could just hear the passion um, about this important case. Um, and I think the case for me, it's different from, from any other case that, that I've encountered because um, in, in Ireland, actually, not just Northern Ireland, it's the only case of its kind. Uh, there's no political um, association with this murder. This is a violent, sexually motivated um, murder uh, which took place in, in 1988. And uh, this young girl had, had, had come here, come to Northern Ireland, age 18. And, and we heard earlier from, from her sister, who's a year older, Frederick, um, and she talked about uh, today with me about, you know, the excitement that Inga had going away on this, this trip. And she was really, really interested in travel. She'd been to Austria a number of times and she was so looking forward to coming um, on this interrailing trip. She was studying and she'd hoped to be a dental nurse um, and then headed off to, to Northern Ireland. And I think that's what really sticks uh, with, with a lot of people, including um, when I hear, um, when I was talking to, to John Dallet, just that this was a student with so many opportunities in front of her. Uh, who'd, who'd done uh, the, the thing that we all want to do after we've, we've had all our studies. We want to go into real and we want to go travel and we want to learn, we want to experience life. And yet she came here and it was the place that she was so looking forward to coming most. Um, Kayleigh will tell us later, I'm sure, from her diary um, that she, she, Ireland, I go there tomorrow. I, I look forward to that most. Uh, and for her to be so horrifically murdered in 2018, when I became involved, there had already been two suspect arrests. Um, there had already been um, 30 years of work done and still the family felt they were no further forward um, in terms of getting uh, any kind of justice for Inga. And at that stage, we had been pressing uh, the police and the, PS, uh, the PPS to, um, to look at the case and, and for the police to submit a file. And that was done then in June uh, 2019, finally after we'd been involved and we'd been campaigning and we'd met uh, the PSNI uh, Superintendent Raymond Murray, who was involved, and finally um, to the family's uh, comfort, a, a suspect file was submitted to the PPS. And that brings me to where we are now. We are now at the stage where we have been, um, the family have been promised that an outcome is pending, that this file is going to be adjudicated on, that a decision is imminent. And the Hauser family um, have, have been waiting for 32 years for a suspect, um, for this killer to be brought to justice. And they are pleading for a decision. They are pleading for someone uh, to have to give the answers to this case. Um, and, and that's... Uh, uh, Frederick's mother and father are both dead now. They're both dead. They both died without having justice for their daughter. Frederick's family was ruined. Um, she uh, said that her mother was never the same again. Um, her father ended up um, in very poor health also. Um, and it's so important to her um, that her younger sister, um, who went away that day when she was 19, Inga was 18, um, that they have some form of answers and that this monster, as she calls him, is brought to justice, whoever he is. We had contact uh, with Munich police, but my parents begged to let them be, to let them, let them in peace. I want justice for Inga for my parents, 
and for Victor, he, he did not know her, but I want... Uh, uh, <coughs> sorry. And Phil, it would have been the university, you had intended to extend an invitation to young people from the university of a similar age, Tenga, to come along and listen. John would have been there and unfortunately events have changed so dramatically. We have not just had the, the health crisis, but we've also, um, John has sadly passed away. But your role in this, it's something that as someone who has been an educator of people that age and how many of your young students, I'm sure that you've waved off and wished good luck as they went off on their, their summer holidays to go trailing around Europe. But the thought of them not coming back is it's unthinkable, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, there were two issues that hit me personally. Um, the, the first one is exactly as you've, you've just said, Alison, it was the the feeling of seeing so many of my own students um, either just coming back or heading away. And, you know, that, that idea that um, they disappear without trace. I mean, the, the body is found, but the trace on the person in terms of what actually happened is gone. And immediately, actually, I, I came, I, I, I was talking to Claire about this in, in the early days. Um, it wasn't that long after my own son had been away for 18 months, including a trip around uh, Australia when he was when he was 18. Um, I think that for me, the the issue has been that sort of personal kind of connection, but also it's not about just unsolved uh, cases. It's about truth, and it's about access to the truth. I mean, we don't know, for all of the investigation, we don't know what actually happened to a young woman coming off a ferry, getting into a lorry and being driven away, and her body being found in Ballypatrick Forest. We don't, we don't know um, any of those details. Furthermore, in terms of not knowing, is we don't know why there have been delays for so long in the investigation. Working on Hillsborough, I worked on Hillsborough for 30 years. Uh, I've worked on other cases for long periods of time. But at least we had information in those cases that we could go on. Where are all the leads followed up? That's the first question that has to be, has to be asked. And what happened in terms of the relationship between the police investigating the case and the family. Because I think working with bereaved families, one of the things that becomes so clear to me is the actual bereavement is exacerbated by that not knowing. And whilst it's another case for those investigating it, every day they're waiting for that phone call, they're waiting for that letter to arrive, uh, to be informed about where the current investigation is and you know, why there are persistent delays. And I think that it's the devastation of the loss. It's, 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 it's almost, families have often described it to me as a second loss, when it is heightened and prolonged by not knowing, by not being given access to information. Why is that? I mean, again, in my own experience, people want resolution so that they can grieve, not knowing the circumstances, uh, not knowing who was culpable, not knowing why this person or persons, and I would guess it's a person, took her life. It has two dimensions. First is the due process of law, which is where we're at now, the process of you know, looking for a prosecution and seeing the evidence of a full and thorough investigation. And again, you know, at the moment, there are clear question marks about how thorough that investigation is. She was absolutely beautiful and talented. I always felt I'm the opposite. I'm the to totally opposite of her. My only contact uh, with the police was uh, in March uh, 2018, in, Mar uh, in March, yes. Um, and so I uh, got further information. Soon after that, we started a family therapy. It helped a little bit. 
There were other families with similar cases. And and also as well as the the initial early investigation, then the later investigation. Obviously, we're in a different place now, yes. and we also have different techniques now in terms of forensics and DNA and all sorts of things that wouldn't have existed when Inga first first disappeared. But as you said, in all the cases that you have worked with, that disengagement between the family and the people who are investigating it, it seems that this family were left alone with very little information, as Claire said. They don't particularly have very good English. They were sent letters in English, which would have needed to be translated. They're people of very limited means, and I think they felt quite lost. And as you said, not knowing what happened, but also feeling as though you're completely disengaged from those who should have been helping you seek justice is, is probably one of the things that compounded um, the fact that this family did suffer so badly, and they have suffered really badly. I mean, it caused the, it caused the breakup of this family. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the distance, uh, both geographically, but also in language, for families to be receiving, not in, their first, not in their first language, material or letters or whatever, is, is, is unforgivable. Because, I mean, the, the only people we should be focusing on in, in, in any death are the, are, are the people who are close to, to, to the person who died. And I think that this, this also is exacerbated by not knowing the facts. I mean, however horrific facts may be, to know what happened and to have some understanding of why it happened is essential to grief. You can't grieve unless you have a clear understanding of the context in which somebody died. Um, and it's for the family to make choices about whether they want the explicit knowledge or not. It's not for others to make those choices for them. But they have none of that. And, and as, we've, as we've been discussing, you know, um, the people who are right at the core of this, apart from a sister that, and, and other relatives, the people at the core of this, the parents have died not knowing. They've died with that heartache. And I can't, um, I can't get away from that, even, even though my work is, is, is to be analytical, my work is to look at case, case material and case notes, and that's how I came into this, was to support in whatever way I can the investigation. Um, you know, I can't get away from the fact that the, the initial suffering has been exacerbated by not knowing and, and they the, the, the twin pillars of justice are, are, are first of all the due process of the law but secondly understanding why an event happened and a phrase that i often use when i'm describing hillsborough but i've seen it in so many other cases and it certainly applies in inga maria's case is that un until those questions are answered until they are delivered that phrase justice delayed is justice denied and the consequences of the denial of justice that is the case in for me in in it's the emotion of the case but it's also the politics of the case it's also the legality of the case and we have to do everything we can now to ensure that the family know, the surviving family know the circumstances, know precisely as much as that can be established what happened and who is culpable. Get killed so brutally, so very brutally. She, she had a broken neck. She was lying half naked behind a staple of wood. My sister was sent in a parcel. We've been waiting 14 days. We've been waiting very long before we could organize everything for her last way. She was buried on the Ostfriedhof in München, Munich, over there, the whole family. Kelly Moss, you have a very unusual role in this because you don't particularly have a, a connection. You didn't have a connection to Inga Maria. It was a story 
that you came across in a book, but took a very personal interest in it and almost became girl detective and set up a blog where you looked at all aspects of, of not just Inga's life, but what happened to her and pieced together as much as you possibly could those last last days and weeks that Inga spent, which were probably among the happiest of her life before this awful event befell her. I think it was from the very beginning, um, as when I first um, came upon the case, um, it was very apparent. Several things were just kind of really um, very evident, and one of which was how unique the circumstances were. That you know, the, the fact that when it happened, you know, it was 1988. It was it was another world essentially, and in a way, I kind of think you know, Inga as a person, it's almost like a, a doorway to another world. Um, you know, she was on this earth so fleetingly. And there's something about her as a person um, that really spoke to me very early on and, um, and intrigued me about her. And I, I was fascinated by her, her beauty and her singularity would end up in these really obscure, out-of-the-way places such as Stranraer and Larm. But there was very little else to go on. There was nothing about Inga as a person. The press reports were very reductive and, and didn't really give any insight into who she was. Um, other than just the very basic facts of her name and her age and her being referred to as a, as a, as a backpacker or a hitchhiker, which, which she never actually was. I felt just really um, inspired and, and moved um, with the story of what had happened to her and the longing to find out more about her as a person. But no one could tell me because that information wasn't available. So I resolved to try and discover as much as I could about her in order to try and create um, a, an online resource. partly to provide the true facts of the case and to turn to the spotlight and, 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 and maintain um, its position in the spotlight until the case is solved. And also to bring Inga into the, the social media, the, the online realm, which she was never a part of, you know, it, it happened. So she died so long before it ever came about. Inga's 30th anniversary was approaching and there was no marker like whenever we went whenever John and I um, either separately or together went to Valley Patrick Forest there was nothing to mark the 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 enormity of this tragedy that had happened to her in, in the, the only instance of a sexually motivated murder of a tourist in Northern Ireland history her case was unique at the time in 1988 and it's still unique to this day there has not been another case um, in Northern Ireland of, of that nature ever since there wasn't a permanent marker to um, allow people to kind of pay their respects and around which um, so much feeling, which I, I'm well aware exists for Inga up in, in Northern Ireland and further afield, but uh, specifically in, in North Antrim, there, there needed to be a focal point or that it would be a, a positive thing for there to be a focal point around which um, this compassion could, could kind of congeal. One of the ways that John and I kind of worked together that we kind of dovetailed was that I would take care of the kind of the creative aspects of things in terms of whether it was writing press releases or writing the wording for Inga's memorial. And John had the political nous and the know-how to be to know who to write to in order to try and obtain uh, sponsorship uh, funding for uh, actually uh, creating the memorial stone. Or and, and we both just had just clicked out over this this passion. He'd actually come down to Dublin uh, to meet me, and um, and we became firm friends. And he sent me an, an open letter that he'd also sent to uh, three leading newspapers in Northern Ireland. The, the momentum of the campaign for Inga just started to increase and, um, and keeping that pressure on was, was, was a key uh, factor, yeah. There's no doubt that the PPS um, have to reach a decision as expeditiously as, as possible and, and to, to acknowledge the, 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 the gravity of, of, of the extent of the loss that has been endured by the Hauser family uh, for decades. And, and not only the Harrison family, the um, Inga's friends, um, the public at, at large need to see a resolution in this case and um, need to see this, this case um, you know, be, be resolved uh, and hopefully to actually enter the stage where, it, it, where the evidence can be tested in a court of law. That needs to happen and it needs to happen fast. I want to get to, to the bottom of, of who did this and who took, who took my baby sister away and why. What did she do wrong? She was a good person. She did not deserve this. Yes, I hope to get justice for us all.
Body, whole family, house, label, ties for us all. No, I want to get justice as soon as possible. Please help me. Thank you.